So um, when we were organizing my visit, um, I think I kind of gave a loose, oh, hi, I'm Koji, by the way. Um, I'm from, uh, well, I'm from uh, the Bay Area and the, like Monterey Bay, Salinas Valley. I, I guess I would say I grew up equally in all three of those places, Central California. And um, I uh, now live in uh, Minneapolis. I uh, trained, most extensively in a little monastery, actually very close to where I grew up uh, in Carmel Valley, a place called Tal Sahara. They made, uh, they have some cookbooks. Um, Ed Brown. Ed Brown. <laughs> Ed Brown. Um, uh, he wrote a letter about how awful my, my food was once. <laughs> no, I hate good for He was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 70s, 70s vegetarian cooking is different from late 2000s vegetarian. <laughs> it's like, there's not even wheat germ on this. It's like, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, and then I, uh, my teacher, uh, my kind of main mentor who lived here in 2017 or 18, um, he uh, got a post at the Austin Zone Center in Texas. So I spent a fair amount of time kind of being his like, I don't know, apprentice at the Austin Zen Center. And then I became the uh, interim resident teacher of the Austin Zen Center. And also in the meantime, from 2011 to 2016, I founded and co-led a, a Zen center in Mid-City, uh, New Orleans, the Mid-City Zen Center, which is still there. Um, but it's peer-led. They, uh, they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't want to mess with teachers. They think paid teachers are maybe a little bit of a headache. They're good to, you know, they're good to have, it's kind of like um, um, a lot of towns in Florida. They're nice to visit. <laughs> but uh, when we were planning this uh, trip for me to come here, um, which is not so far for me, uh, it's like a one hour flight, it would be a five hour drive or something like that. Um, that I was asked, uh, so what are your Dharma talks going to be about? Which the where I come from at San Francisco is in the center. You never had to say what your Dharma talk was going to be about. You just say I'm going to get a Dharma talk, and people come for Dharma talk. So I uh, so I named my Dharma talks like I don't know, like two months ago or something like that. So I like uh, a couple of days ago. I'm like, what did I say I was going to talk about on the Sunday when I, that I leave? And I looked and it was. Um, U plus zero equals awake. Did anybody even read the website and see that that was the topic? Wow. Okay, so you look. What would, if it says something different, what would you, if it was, you know, if it was about like, you know, gosh, what would have been an unappealing thing? I already forgot. The necessity of, pre, the necessity of precepts and, a, and abstinence from caffeine. Um. So uh, I'm like, oh, I must, I must have been in a mood when I came up with that. Um, but it's a phrase that I use sometimes to describe what I think of as, as a shift in emphasis um, and the uh, early common era in Buddhism. So Buddhism is already existing for like 500 to 600 years. And you, uh, you know, Buddhism's a story, you know, if you're an idealist and if you, have a hard time knowing what to trust. And if you're looking for authority and you're looking for authenticity, one of the natural responses to that is to try to figure out what's the original teaching here, you know? And a lot of people do that. So there, people get uh, find, come across what we call the Nikayas or the Pali Canon or the Theravada Buddhism. And they would say, now that is the authentic and original teaching of the Buddha. And all of this emptiness and bodhisattvas and, you know, uh, Tantra and Zen, these are all kind of weird little later perversions on Buddhism. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, 
And, um, and if you're not doing what is really in the earliest scriptures, you're kind of doing a weird kind of made up thing. Um, and that's fine. I think, you know, everybody's got their own little spheres of meaning that they have to live in. And, you, and it's hard, and they're a hard thing to laterally jump across from. So you gotta do what makes sense in your, in your world system. <laughs> you know, we don't all live in the same world system. You know, um, but uh, one way that I think of it is that, um, you know, the um, agenda of Buddhism is um, why does life feel this way um, instead of that way? That way seems very, um, would make sense to me, you know? It's that way it feels like it would feel like a gift. Why does it feel this way where it doesn't quite feel like a gift? That's the fundamental premise. And then everything is a, an attempt to answer that question. Why does life feel this way instead of that way? Um, and the first set of teachings was an answer to that. You know, and then um, time being what it is and people being what they are, there were, they found uh, difficulties with that or things gain a certain amount of steam and they get kind of presented in a certain way and people are, uh, could get to reform things and be like, well, and, and in, the, in the culture of South Asia, there were tons of people doing all kinds of yogic and meditation practices trying to answer that same question, not just Buddhism, you know. And so they were cross-contaminating a lot. So you have the Buddhist sitting there doing shamatha and vipassana, and then they see someone else down the way with, you know, plugging one nostril and inhaling, and then plugging the other nostril and exhaling, and then retaining the breath. And they're like, what are they doing over there? <laughs> <laughs> you know? It's like, it seems to have a profound effect on their well-being. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a way we could co-op that and make it Buddhist, <laughs> you know, because the philosophy is kind of secondary to the, to the, to the um, efficacy, you know, the prioritizing efficacy, you know, so you had all of these um, meditational methods and all these varying philosophies, but the medita meditational methods had a lot in common. You know, many other people know what they're doing in yoga is very different than what we're doing in Buddhism because they believe in a self. You know, and then you go to the yoga people and you're like, the other Buddhists say that you believe in a self. Describe what you're calling the self. And they're saying, well, it is just this undescribable force that just makes things how they are. You know, and then you go back to the Buddhists and they're like, they say the self is an undescribable force that um, makes things how they are. What do we say? And like, well, we say there is no undescribable force that makes things how they are. There's just emptiness, which is an undescribable force. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. It's not Brahman, you know. So if you look at, you know, the like Advaita Vedanta yoga school from about 700 AD and what they have to say about ultimate reality, and when you look at uh, like the Jyamakin, so this is like first or second century common era. Um, and see what they have to say about emptiness. And you, you could, if you just take, if you mix the words Brahman and emptiness, you, the descriptions are identical, you know? So Buddhism are, are often giving themselves a pat on the back. Um, um, but uh, we're defining ourselves in kind of a vacuum. It's very interesting. I grabbed the Rupert Gethin, um, anthology called like introduction to buddhist thought or something like that or complete introduction to buddhist thought it's a very helpful book actually but you go into the index and you're looking for stuff from the hindu tradition and none of it's in there and it presents it almost as if buddhism was kind of created in a vacuum you know with uh, with free of outside influences but the religious culture the yogic culture of south asia throughout the whole common era was a lot of dialogue yeah anyway um, so this u plus zero equals awake is a response, is an approach to the early Mahayana school, and I would say is an approach to um, 
the approach of the Zen school and the approach of some of the Tibetan schools where there's this idea that, um, you know, the kind of like this guided meditation that we just did earlier, there's this fundamental aspect of mind that's got no problems, you know, and actually what things are empty of is that they're empty of the imagined. They're empty of the essence that's imputed. They're empty of this fixed intrinsic self that needs protecting. But the way your mind functions, excellent. Even, even in the midst of fear, even in the midst of aversion, even in the midst of greed, it is all makes perfect sense. You know? The problem is the um, interpretation that arises when we're, when, we're in, when we're understanding what comes up in reference to this idea of this independent, inherent, self-existent I, you know? Um, so there's this thing that happens. Let's say you're sitting here and let's say the neighbors are talking and the windows are, it's a, you know, there's this roller coaster, you know, it's like, it's been hot as hell. Now it's not hot as hell. Let's open the windows. Oh my God, when you open the windows, it's cool in here and you get to hear the little either crickets or cicadas or whatever they are, the little insect sounds. And then you're like, this is great. And then human voices. <laughs> yeah. This is a disturbance. <laughs> yeah. Everything that you're encountering is an innocent bystander to your agenda, your self-interest, you know, and your imputing essence on the experiences that you're having. You know, and you could say, no, it's not disturbance. It is just sound or something like that. That's one way to approach it. You're creating a little bit high of a bar for yourself, I think, a little bit idealistic. You know, uh, you can't just circumvent um, cause and effect in your, in your karmic mean creation machine. But you could say, yeah, why wouldn't it bother me? And just leave it at that. Yeah. Oh, that's irritating. Why wouldn't it be irritating? Yeah, okay. Great. What about the birds? Well, <laughs> <laughs> the birds are pretty, the birds, uh, we can, a lot of us could go either way on the birds, I think. Some of us like them. Depends on the bird, you know? Depends on if it's a tweeter or a squawker. <laughs> Life is full of tweeters and squawkers. And they're all fundamentally the same. <laughs> That's the news. That's the news. Yeah. It is a tweeter's nature to tweet, and it is a squawker's nature to squawk. And they're just this temporary coming together of body and mind, this temporary juxtaposition. And they're, they're just this doing what they can't help but do because their mind's been conditioned from beginningless time. And they manifest as a tweeter and they manifest as a squawker. And the only problem is on how you feel about it, you know? Or how you feel about how you feel about it. You know, I don't like squawking. Great, I don't like squawking. Why would you like squawking? Excellent. Let's get on with our lives. <laughs> you know? Anyway, so in this, in this U plus zero is like, you know, you fundamentally have the tools that you need which is a luminous and clear mind. You have the capacity to know. The definition of mind in Buddhism is that which is clear and knowing. It is not that which thinks about X, Y, and Z. You know, it is that fundamental mirror-like quality. You know, it's, it's just your ability to apprehend anything is mind. It's not the brain. A lot of the times um, in Asia, when people say mind, they point to the heart. You know, it's just this, it's a whole, network of material and immaterial things working together to create the ability to apprehend. And when you actually look for this thing called mind, there's not a thing that you get to call mind. Yet, there is everything that the mind can perceive happening. So there's the emptiness and there is the clarity. Your mind is empty of the thingness, but then there's the clarity that is the nest that arises within the emptiness. Um, so, um, what's the point of that? So it's not so much that 
you need to um, launch a campaign against your delusion. You know, that's that's the distinction I think between some of the early presentations of Buddhism and in, in our kind of way. You're not launching a campaign against your delusion. You're not launching a campaign against wrong views. You don't have to sell yourself short by saying, "Well, that's just my story." It's like, why wouldn't it be your story? You don't have to gaslight yourself for having an emotional life. Um, but to just hold that all with a light hand, know that it is of the nature to arise, abide, and, and cease. You know, this is a feeling that I got right now. You know, and it makes perfect sense. You know? um, but leaning into the unconditioned aspect of that and acquainting yourself with it and being curious about it and sipping from it. You know, sipping from that kind of luminous, joyous neutrality of it. Um, and then we're just kind of um, acquainting ourselves with the not problem aspect of our existence. There was this guided meditation that we did in our retreat yesterday where you either, you're sitting, and usually when we're sitting, there's one thing we could find to complain about physically, you know? But I said, even if you can't find anything uncomfortable, just take your little fingernail and just stick it in your thumb a little bit, just so a sensation arises, you know? There's all Tibetan practice. You know, just create a little discomfort, and then you can ask yourself, okay, we can say that that's we can say that that's discovered. We can say that this is unpleasant. In the midst of this unpleasant, are you aware? Does awareness, is awareness itself displaced by the phenomena of mind? You know, or does the phenomena of mind arise within awareness? And that awareness is neutral, empty, clear, and always there. And if you say, I am not aware, how would you know that you're not aware? Unless that was fundamentally arising within the universe. So rec the recognition of that fundamentally empty and clear awareness, and uh, sometimes I think of, um, I'm, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm not really a sports person. <laughs> um, you know how to do a lesson. I'm very good. I rodeo. rodeo. I used to do rodeo. Oh. Yeah, and I've raised <laughs> six pigs for the fair. Um, <laughs> my first in 1992 was reserved for a train champion. I was on the cover of the newspaper, <laughs> the King City Wrestler. I've been on the cover of the newspaper, the King City Wrestler, twice, both with pigs. <laughs> um, one was the one that I raced for 4-H, and the other one was when I was like two years old, and the headline was, nice shot, Dad. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> fun fact about that. Um, but, uh, what the hell was I talking about? Sports. Oh, Pigs. sports. There's this thing. There's this thing that happens in baseball where apparently, like, if you start running, um, and then you turn back or something, you have to like tag up. I don't. I don't know what it means, but you gotta like tag up. Uh, you have to go put your foot back on the base yeah. to reestablish contact <coughs> with but, being safe. Pop, pop, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, a sack fly or you know when there's an out, if somebody's on first and they rush to second, mm. but then somebody catches it, they got to run back. You got to run back. Okay, so you know establishing a a, a relationship with this fundamentally uh, clear and um, empty awareness. And uh, throughout your day, throughout your life, tagging up, you know, and you're just uh, creating a life of um, keeping your finger on the pulse of that, and you're just helping yourself to it, you know. And it's not this long art trajectory of you purifying who you are, you come to a point of realizing something. Think about how people are with other religions. You know, Buddhism is the only 
the way white people do Buddhism is the only religion where people think that it's some kind of endeavor that you got and you're and you're starting off as some kind of wrong thing. And if you do it right, you're gonna end up some right thing. That's not how my mom does Catholicism. You know? And it's actually a great benefit to her because it's not some self-improvement regime, it's just something she avails herself. You know, she goes to church and she receives communion. She doesn't earn communion. You know, she doesn't show up with a list of hours spent praying. And, uh, you know, she answers a question about, you know, a psalm where she gets wrung out of the room and told to go, go back and pray longer or something like that, <laughs> you know? So letting Buddhism be this thing that you avail yourself to that actually nourishes you as soon as you, as soon as you take up. Can I ask a question about that? Because don't a lot of Christians think like they're born in sin and they need to purify to become? Holy? You know, isn't that they thing? might? I'm I'm Sicilian Catholic, so we don't we don't really know any of the teachings. We just go <laughs> we just go pray. You know, but, but there's some qualification to receive the Eucharist, right? Well, yeah, you got to get baptized. Unless you're Episcopalian, you just got to show up. You know, anyway, that's, sometimes if we take my metaphors to the logical conclusion, they just start backfiring. So, <laughs> I would say anything taken to its logical conclusion has been taken too far. <laughs> um, but anyway, so irrespective of what real Christians do, um, you can, uh, how do you want to do this? You know, is your, is your starting point that I'm some, that I'm a wrong thing that needs to be transformed? Or is it, because often we don't walk through the door thinking that. Sometimes we do. But if we're lucky, we just want some peace. We just want some rest. You know, and then someone comes in and starts telling you what Buddhism is. And they start cheating you out of that very, very simple agenda. You know, they're like, no, not only do you need some rest, but you're in delusion. And if you do our practice right, whether it, you enjoy it or not, you're going to get the golden carrot of awakening. You know? I want to pull the plug on that because guess what happens when you stop seeking guess what happens when you stop telling yourself you're not good enough guess what happens when you start just sitting down and touching the the innate emptiness and clarity of your mind with gratitude everything that you've been trying to make happen through self-improvement arises spontaneously because the heart is settled in entrusting you I had thought that I was only going to talk for a couple of minutes and open it to Q and A, but I talked longer than a couple of minutes. But I still have time for Q and A. I've been talking a lot of this week. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. Um, I connect with what you're saying about um, not starting from a place where you are you are the problem that needs to be fixed. I still feel some desire to use your great effort. Mm -hmm. and maybe it's just not a new one. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, yeah. We can't hear you. Oh, hear. maybe it's just because, uh, sorry. Uh, I was saying, uh, I connect to what he's saying about uh, uh, not treating yourself like a problem that needs to be fixed, but I still feel some desire to exert uh, great effort. And, uh, and maybe it's maybe it's curiosity, maybe it's a personality thing. Mm -hmm. Is there a, anything to yeah. weigh in on? Yeah, that? yeah. I mean, you know, one of the one of the paramitas, one of the six perfections, one of the and actually this is a little known thing, um uh or a little said thing, is that really when the Mahayana movement began, the paramitas replaced the evil path as the path. So that's why a lot of Mahayana people don't really talk about the Eightfold Path. Um, but the six paramitas is the path of practice in the Mahayana path. But um, one of the paramitas is virya. You know, and virya is a Sanskrit word that, um, because uh, Sanskrit is part of the Indo-European language family, there's a proxy to it. There's cognates in, in European languages. Virya is like viral, yeah. um, 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 like energetic you know, bustling with energy. So Viri is one of the, the um, um, 
power mixes. Now, I think you can totally, so that would, so the question that you could start turning around is, what is energy that isn't rooted in improvement? Mm. You know, how do I, where does energy come from? Where does energy go when it's not rooted in fixing? Mm. You know, and I think, let's say you are um, cultivating food. You know, let's say you're growing food. And there are certain conditions that are going to make that happen. You know, certain supportive conditions. And depending on the food, depending on the environment, all of those are going to be different. There's not like a blanket condition. If you're growing, you know, cabbage in the Pacific Northwest versus strawberries in Mexico, the way that you cultivate that, the conditions that give rise to the fruition are going to be different. The seed is different, the environment is different, the outcome is different, you know, the anticipated outcome is different. Now, when you begin that whole process, you're not taking a seed and saying, I'm going to fix this wrong thing. <laughs> <laughs> this dumb, worthless seed does not know what it really is, you know, and I'm going to give it some goddamn water, <laughs> you know, and some I'm going to force some sunlight onto it so that it does what it's supposed to do, you know, but there's this um, nurturing, you know, and that takes energy. Nurturing takes energy, you know, parenting, that kind of nurturing takes energy, you know, cultivating, you're creating conditions to give rise to what you know can be the um, desired unfolding, the truest unfolding of this thing. You know, so there's not like this, um, we're not trying to become Buddhists because Buddhists are good and we're bad. We're trying to become Buddhists because we are Buddhists. You know, and you're trying to turn that seed into whatever vegetable it is or whatever fruit it is because that is what it is. Not because it's a broken thing that needs to turn into a different thing that is better than what it is. So it's the kind of transformation that is actually calling forth the original nature of something, you know? And so you're creating the conditions to support that. And that, and what's involved in that is being in dialogue with yourself and your well-being all along, you know? And that's part of making it your own too. You know, I always say, I think I say it once a day, the stakes are too high to not receive teaching, but the stakes are too high to not make it your own, you know? So if you have a teacher that's like, don't worry about all this other stuff. Just, just sit or something like that. And you know that if you spend an hour a day moving your body, the causes and conditions of your sense of ease and safety are doubled. You know, then that's part of what's being taken into, into consideration into that cultivation. You know, yeah. does that make sense? It does. Thank you. I have a question. Yeah. You mentioned something about uh, if you're gaslighting yourself, and I can't remember the exact context that you said it, but can you give some examples on how we might be gaslighting ourselves? How we might be gaslighting ourselves? I think um, there's a kind of difficult line that we walk when we're introduced to these yogic teachings that bring into question how the mind is conditioned you know, and start to shine a light on the extent to which the mind is conditioned and the extent to which we're imputing meaning on things, you know, and then we start to get into some tricky territory um, because it's prob it is a problem to think that every notion that arises in your mind is your, is a direct telegram letter from reality telling you how things are, you know, to think, someone's so mad. You know, or something like that, or um, so and so's rude, or I disappointed, blah blah blah, or I said the wrong thing, or they all think I'm an idiot, or something like that. Um, or these people need to be shown the truth. <laughs> you know, whatever it is. So to take the notions that arise and then, then during the meditation, notions arise spontaneously due to innumerable, innovable causes and conditions. Sometimes they have a relationship with 
reality in a way that is helpful and informative. You know, and sometimes we know. You know, so being a practitioner is being able to, is generating a curiosity of discerning appearance and reality. You know, why why this arose in this way in my sphere of meaning, my sphere of meaning making, but developing a relationship to things where you want to create an experience of your life where you can feel safe enough to ask those questions. Because if your well being feels precarious then that is going to start to be kind of cataclysmic. So sometimes I think like I've had friends that are very, very high anxiety and I'm like, let's not worry about emptiness teachings. I think you need God. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think you need to believe in a higher power because the emptiness teachings are going to stress you out because you're not going to have anything to lean on. You know, the emptiness teachings, when you're properly understood, they, they don't take away the thing to lean on. You know, empty of inherent existence itself actually makes the self huge. You know, it doesn't make the self narrow. But if your predisposition isn't going in that direction, then it's it's going to become a stressful undertaking. You know, so we're we're doing this thing where we're trying to discern. Now, when sometimes when we would start doing that, um, we start to disbelieve everything that arises, or talk ourselves out of the validity of everything that arises. And if we're in community, and especially if we're in community where there's authority figures um, that are, and that authority figure can be a spouse, that authority figure can be a teacher, you know, that authority figure can be anybody that's in a power up position from you, or who, somebody whose your well being kind of depends on, and so you're incentivized to please them. So if you have an emotion arise or a belief arise or a notion arise that is not pleasing to an authority figure in your life or not pleasing to your own inner sense of how to act right. You know, let's say you're at an energetic boundary. Let's say someone's like, could you volunteer to do this thing? And you're like, I absolutely have no time for that. But the, but the correct answer is yes, because I'm a good person. You know, um, just hypothetically. Um, you know, sometimes I do that in my relationship, you know, it's like, it's like, um, can you do this with me? And it's like, the correct answer is yes, because I'm a good person and I'm negating any felt experience. I'm not standing on my own two feet. I'm not standing in the reality of my own experience, you know? So once we start opening that can of worms of not necessarily buying into the notions that arise, then we create this vulnerability, you know, to, um, talk ourselves out of our hard-won boundaries and our hard-won realities, you know? And I see that happen. I mean, that is all monastic life is. That's why I don't tell my students to go, <laughs> to go live how I lived because it's, it's, it's a minefield of people pressuring you to, to, to relinquish your autonomy. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. We got a three-way tie. <laughs> well, I, it's sort of an addendum to, to what you just said. It was so helpful to hear that, like, you know, if I'm irritated by the humans or the bird, of course, because yeah. it's the next layer that really makes me miserable, which is, man, I'm a terrible person because I don't like the sound of birds yeah. or whatever. Yeah. You know, like, why would I kill the fun of these people by, like, yeah. being mad at them? Yeah. And like that critical voice comes in, which mm -hmm. it's so freeing then to think, yeah, of course I'm irritated. Yeah. Whatever, get on with the next thing. Yeah. You know, and it and it feels true. Like yeah. it's just a part of the experience. Yeah. And just so so the first step of all of this is accepting what's arising. And we say that all the time, but we don't really do it when push comes to shove, because we have a lot of ideas about what a good person is. You know, and I, I remember I was living at um I was living at the uh, Tassahara, and there was a rule, you can't wear jewelry in the Zen. You can't wear jewelry in the Zen, and your hair has to be up and off your neck. And no fragrances. Uh, no fragrances. <laughs> There's an old man that used to come every summer named Dale Carlson that wore a toe ring. And one time, you know, like, can you not wear your toe ring? And it was like his last summer, he was like furious. Like, Do you know, I come here and chop onions every summer. Um, but, um, there was a lady there that wanted to be a priest and she was in training she was super devout um and she just had just from here to here just 
cuff, 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 earring, earring, earring. Because this is like, you know, this is like 2003 or whatever. Well, maybe that was more in style to just have like loads of earrings. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, um, I went to my teacher and I'm like, Wendy's got tons of earrings. You know, what, what, is, what is going on there? What is this? How come nobody said anything? You know, because I want, because um, everybody that's doing something wrong is ruining my experience. <laughs> um, <laughs> And that's the thing that happens in Zen spaces a lot when there's a lot of pressure to perform the forms, you know? Um, uh, you know, these young boys get all pissy because someone else says I am laying down or something like that. Like, ah, this should be, you know, they're giving into their comfort or something like that. They're being lazy. And it's like, dude, shut up. But, um, <laughs> but so my teacher, I'm like, what's with these earrings? And he goes, some people have earrings. You know, that was, that was the most perfect, best answer. It's my mm-hmm. business, yeah. you know? And like, and, and one time I went into him and uh, I went to, to focus on one-on-one in, interaction. And, um, cause I was bright, you know? And like people would meet me and even when I was a kid, like, you're gonna be the abbot someday. And, like, I used to deal with that kind of stuff. And I went to him and I'm like, I feel like I'm special, you know? And I was ready for him to, Take that away. I was offering it to him to take it away from me. You know, to be raving me because yeah, I don't know if you've had this experience, but if people are criticizing you, you know they're telling the truth. Um uh and he goes, Why wouldn't you feel special? And then he just sat there for a long time and he goes, just don't feel special. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so that was my response. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I'm, uh, you know, when you say all the operations of the mind mm-hmm. are perfect expression of the mind, this awareness. Yeah. But then we still need to discern that point where, you know, we're irritated at the bird, and then our imaginations take over. I mean, are those the perfect operations of the mind too? The the machine isn't broke. You know, it's just in a certain conditional reality where it, where it struggles, where it struggles to function without creating art. Mm-hmm. You know, so uh, the Buddhist technical term for that is called papancha which means mental proliferation. Um, and uh, when you're experiencing, so, but then it's like, how do you know you're having a punch? Because of the perfectly functioning awareness, you know, and the awareness that knows peace as a point of reference, you know? And so you're recognizing papancha, and as a practitioner that's developing the skill set, you're being interested in you know, what isn't wine? This is a great con. This is a great touchstone in our practice all the time. What is it to not want things to change and to not want things to stay the same? You know, to introduce that as a response to mental proliferation. Can you say that again? You kind of figured it out. What yeah. is it to not want things to change and to not want things to stay the same? Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you can reach and grab it, that's not the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about the difference between kind of accepting other people where they're at? I, I, I can think of coworker situations and mm-hmm. familial relations versus places where those hard won boundaries sit. I'm struggling a lot with kind of the barriers between what's healthy boundaries versus what is, okay, I do have these resources, I can help these people, I can try to interact with these ways. And yeah. And how that intersects with the practice. Do you want like a rule? I got too many of those. <laughs> Dealer's choice, unfortunately. <laughs> you know, um, I think um, 
to view, you know, part of the bodhisattva path, the path of, you know, liberating all sentient beings, is to view um, all of us as a family. And you can kind of take your self-interest out of it. You know, and not, and I don't mean self-interest out of it in the sense that um, you'll throw yourself under the bus, but actually relating to yourself as if you were your own child, you know, and, and just looking at this, okay, what if this wasn't, what if I wasn't in this equation? You know, what if this interaction was two people that I'm watching? You know, what is the path to taking care of people? You know, um, and um, so I sometimes I think, you know, the, the extent to which I'm interested in myself is the extent to which I'm interested in ending suffering. So to think about what is not contributing to suffering in self, in self and other, and that needle is not going to fall in the same place all the time, you know, because, uh, Nothing ever has fallen in the same place <laughs> twice. So it's not super helpful, but it's something you have to move through. Um, I think we know the difference. Well, no, we don't. <laughs> I was gonna say we know the difference between when we're being selfish and when we're and when we're taking care of ourselves, but most of us don't actually. So that would be a good thing to start being curious. And you could go put yourself through a bunch of exercises for that. Being like, how would I feel about it if I saw someone else doing it? How would I feel about it if I was someone that I treat yourself like someone you care about that isn't you? <laughs> that's how that's how you give yourself the best advice. <laughs> Anything else?